Hey, hey there, YouTube. Baylor here from the Cozy Studio, and today I want to talk about potions in Slay the Spire. Did you know that there is 42 different potions in this game? It's a heck of a lot. And today we're going to rank all of them, give some quick thoughts on how I think each can be used, what you might want to use them for, and how they rank, how they stack up relative to one another. If you like this video, don't forget to drop a like below and let me know in the comments what your own personal favorite potion is. What are you more happy to see than anything else? when it drops from the jaw worm, or when given to you by Niao. Without further ado, let's start talking. These are in no particular order, so I'm just gonna go one at a time. Starting with fruit juice, which is uh, definitely an unusual potion. Fruit juice gives you five max health instead of any sort of immediate battle effect. It's always, always really good to see one. However, oftentimes you would prefer a, a real potion to help you overcome an immediate threat. But I'm never disappointed when a fruit juice drops, so it definitely ranks very high up in my tier list. I'm gonna put it in A tier because it's good, but it, it's not amongst the best potions. Fruit juice is exceptional if seen early, and it gets even better if you've got a sacred bark, which makes it 10 max health. Sometimes these things show up in stores because the fruit juice is a rare potion. It's about 100 gold. And 100 gold for 5 max health is not usually a deal that I think is all that good. So I don't usually advocate for buying fruit juice if you see it. But I'm always happy to see it drop. I think Fairy in a Bottle is something kind of similar. Fairy in a Bottle is another odd potion in that you don't get to choose when you use the fairy, generally speaking. Fairy only activates when you die and heals you for 30% of your max health. Effectively a rest in a jar. But it also negates any additional like overkill damage from the hit that killed you. For that reason, I think Fairy in a Bottle is a very excellent potion, particularly if you've got a Potion Belt, uh, which really brings Fairy in a Bottle up to up to the best of, uh, of potion territories. Just having that backup option that can, can kind of save you no matter what is really nice. And what I, what I particularly appreciate about Fairy in a Bottle is that if you have it, you can be more ambitiously aggressive with your choices. You can, you can take risks. Uh, in dangerous situations. For example, fighting an elite you might not have been able to handle, and you don't even need to actually use the fairy in a jar to get the advantage there. Simply allowing yourself to take the risk because you have a backup option uh, is very nice, even if you don't have to use the backup. So a lot of times I'll find myself choosing not to rest in a situation where maybe I should because I have a fairy in a bottle, and then I end up defeating the elite or defeating the boss with seven or three health left. And, and everything's fine, and I still have the Fairy in a Bottle. It's, it's fantastic. Ancient Potion. Ancient Potion gives you one artifact, negating one debuff. I tend to rank these pretty low early in the run. In Act 1 and early Act 2, there's not a whole lot of debuffs that are able to be blocked by one artifact that are all that important. You can block being vulnerable from Gremlin Nub, you can block the dexterity down from Legavulin, but you need two, two artifact to block the first strength down that a Legavulin applies, which really doesn't uh, really doesn't help you there. It's nice for blocking Frail from various enemies. You can also block Hex from Chosen. But overall, the problem with the Ancient Potion is that you don't usually have the choice to use it in every combat. For example, a block potion, you know, 12 block, whenever, that can that can be used in any fight, no matter what. But the ancient potion is great in some combats, worse in others. And I don't think I would, would rank it that highly overall, actually, because of that. Generally speaking, my personal best use case for the ancient potion is to block vulnerable against the heart. That saves you essentially 33 health, I think. 15 plus, no, 38 health, excuse me. 15 plus 23. 38 health by not being vulnerable to uh, the heart, which is a tremendous amount of additional mitigation, but it's only in that one endgame fight. And in most of the rest of the run, I think it's B or C tier. We'll give it B. B because of the use case against heart, C overall otherwise. Does have a very notable combo. Let's actually rank the, the flex and speed potions now because they, they interact so well with the ancient potion. These potions give five strength and dex for one turn in conjunction with an ancient potion. They can be very, very powerful though, because using an artifact means the debuff that reduces your stat gets blocked. And therefore you get to keep the five strength or five dexterity for an entire combat. This is particularly useful with Sacred Bark, 
uh, because Sacred Bark both doubles the power of the debuff potions and doubles the amount of artifact that you get. So you get to kind of double dip there if you've got Sacred Bark. But overall, this is a, a very powerful combination. Uh, although I have to say one I don't admit, one I don't f assemble that often. That said, overall, the speed and flex potions, I think are pretty, pretty solid here. I'd probably put them in B tier overall because of that interaction that they have. They're decently good early on. The five strength or five dex can be a pretty good amount of damage if well utilized. Uh, for example, being a tremendous amount of damage on Watcher. Actually, I might even put Flex Potion in A tier because of that. Uh, on Watcher and Ironclad specifically, five strength for one turn can be very enormous. Yeah, I'm thinking A tier for A tier for the Flex, B tier for the Speed. This five points of strength feels more worth it to me than five points of Dex most of the time. That's my thought. You can also use orange pellets or other sources of artifact to negate the downside from these potions, which makes them very, very powerful in those situations. But only in those situations, otherwise they're just one-time expendable stuff. How about Block Potion? I think Block Potion is about as... about as average... solidly good, but average, as they get. Perhaps the, the definition of C plus tier? 12 health for one potion is, I would say, right along the curve for what you expect to get out of a potion drop. Anything that can do better than that is a good potion. Anything that does worse than that is a bad potion. So I would call I would call the block potion almost the definition of average. Now block potion does have a couple situations where it can be better than just 12 health. And those are true on the ironclad. Um, if you have specifically the cards body slam or entrench. Body Slam means the block potion can be 12 block and 12 damage, whereas Entrench means you can double the block from the block potion. I guess Barricade can also matter on Ironclad, because then you can carry the block over from turn to turn. So those are some things that can make the block potion better, but I would say it's about as average as they get, and I'm going to call that C tier, I suppose. Although, if we're, if we're on a scale from D to S, perhaps B is the solid average. I'm not going to have a lot of room in C and D tier if I don't make Block Potion C, though. So I'm going to put Block Potion in C. Okay. Focus Potion. I think Focus Potion's a very, very good potion. One of the best solid stat up potions. Plus two focus on defect is such a help, no matter really what stage of the game you're in. I find that a Focus Potion really makes an, an Act 1 Elite very, very easy to manage in the early game. And in the late game, one or, or um, ideally multiple hoarded focus potions can be your whole plan for the heart. If you keep two or three of them with a potion belt, channel a lot of orbs, it's uh, definitely a way to tackle the late game. So the focus potion starts good and just gets better with time, I tend to feel. That is very much not true of the... What's this thing called? Blessing of the Forge. Blessing of the Forge starts really good and then gets worse. Blessing of the Forge upgrades all cards in your hand, and right at the start of a run, that can be one or two additional points of energy, or it might also be three points of damage, three points of block on all of your cards. And if you draw those cards again, then you get to benefit from them again. The later you get into your run, the more likely you are to have your cards already upgraded. And that means that the Blessing of the Forge, I think it's a little bit worse over time. So I'm not, not frequently excited about a Blessing late game, but very often in Act 1, if I see Blessing of the Forge, I'm very happy. And I'd say it's solidly B tier, a very, very useful and powerful potion a lot of the time. Quick note, by the way, um, the potions that we're discussing here, each one has an outline if it's a class-specific potion corresponding to the color of that character. So a focus potion with blue outline here means it's a defect-specific potion. Our blood potion here with a red outline that tells us it's ironclad-specific. Blood potion is two-thirds of a rest, 20% of your max health. And on ironclad, that can be quite a lot. What makes the blood potion really special for me is that you can drink it at any time, which means that you can have a blood potion in your belt, find a new potion on the ground, and drink the blood potion immediately, then allowing you to pick up the new potion. And for that reason, I rank blood potion quite highly. It's guaranteed health on the clad. It's usable at any time. It's overall just something I'm really happy to see. I'm going to put it right up in A tier, because I think it's just a very consistently very good, if not amazingly powerful overall potion. Essence of Steel. Essence of Steel gives you four plated armor, four block per turn, 
but every time you take attack damage, you lose one point of that plated armor. So oftentimes, Essence of Steel is 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1, which is only 10, 10 health saved, or less. Um, I often tend to find that this is maybe like 7 health saved, sometimes only 4, if you miss time uh, when the Essence of Steel is used. Essence of Steel is at its best when you're able to use the four block per turn to consistently, perfectly block your opponent. Uh, a really quick example of when Essence of Steel is really good against the three sentries in Act 1, who do 10 damage per turn once you kill one of them. An Essence of Steel plus an Aura Calcum is a guaranteed automatic 10 block at the end of every turn, and that means you cannot take damage against either remaining sentry. That's probably the ideal use case for this thing, but most of the time I tend to find it really falls flat. Other noteworthy thing is that um, with Sacred Bark, 8 plated armor feels a lot better than 4. It's more block, but it also means you have to take damage more times before the block decays. Problem with Essence of Steel is you need to be clairvoyant to get maximum use. I think that's a good description of it. Ultimately, I have to rank Essence as one of the overall worst performing potions in Slay the Spire. Yes, it does have times when it can be really helpful, but in almost all of those times, I'd rather have something else. How about Bottled Miracle? Bottled Miracle is a Watcher Potion. Gives you two miracles. It's kind of like an energy potion, but you get to split the energy over multiple turns if you want to. It also fills up your hand, which is good, I want to say. Since the Watcher has cards that scale with uh, hand size. You can also upgrade those miracles via, via a myriad of ways, and those miracles can trigger relics like the Letter Opener or the Dead Branch. So I tend to think that Bottled Miracle is a, a very good potion overall. I'll put that up in A tier there. How about Attack Potion? Attack Potion's a great potion. Guaranteed damage. All attacks always do damage, so you know whenever you're drinking an Attack Potion that you're getting free damage. Now, sometimes when you drink an attack potion, you get a lot of free damage, because every character has very big, powerful attacks. Uh, with Silent being the biggest exception there. But, for example, an attack potion on the defect can create a zero-cost meteor strike. An attack potion on the ironclad can create a zero-cost bludgeon or immolate. An attack potion on watcher can create a zero-cost ragnarok. And... For that possibility, I tend to think that the Attack Potion deserves a pretty good overall ranking. I'm going to be putting it up in B here. Attack Potions get a lot worse overall as you get later into the run, and just the value of one card tends to diminish. And there aren't a whole lot of ways to scale the Attack Potion, but it's always something I'm very excited to have in my early Act 1 and Act 2s as a insurance policy against elites. That's al almost always my use case for an attack potion, is tackling an elite of some kind. Which is about what I do with the fire potion, too. I tend to think fire potions and attack potions are almost interchangeable. I'm going to rank them the same for that reason. They also look really good in red next to one another. The fire potion is not as potentially powerful as the attack potion, but it's just nice guaranteed 20 damage, which is perfect for dealing with one quick threat. It's a, a way to kill one of the three slavers quickly, one of the three sentries quickly. The extra edge you might need to finish off a gremlin knob or a book of stabbing. Um, a way to snipe a gremlin instantly if you need to. Just, just a little bit of damage when you need it. Downside to the fire potion is it's not a lot of damage, just a little. The By the time I reach Act 3, I'm almost never happy with a fire potion. Yeah, fire, notably, the fire potion's immune to weaken, so there's no way for enemies to reduce the damage that, that it does to them. And it can be nice for that. But it just doesn't do numerically enough to, uh, to justify it. And I think I'm going to put the explosive potion, since, since we're talking about direct damage potions, we'll rank the explosive potion as well. Um, 10 damage to all enemies has broader utility in multi-enemy fights. Really good in Act 1 and Act 2, again, but quickly irrelevant by Act 3, since the 10 damage it deals is just not enough to be significant. How about the Essence of Darkness? This is the rare potion for the defects. 
And the Essence of Darkness channels one Dark Orb for every Orb slot you have. So after you drink an Essence of Darkness, all of your Orb slots will be full of Dark Orbs. Each of those Dark Orbs starts at a value of 6 damage and then does an additional 6 per turn. So you can think of an Essence of Darkness with base 3 Orb slots as 18 damage per turn, so to speak. Another way I can phrase just how good Essence of Darkness is. Essence of Darkness plus the Defect starting deck will defeat any Act 1 boss. Doesn't matter what cards you have in your Defect deck. If you have an Essence of Darkness and you go into the Slime Boss fight, the Hexaghost fight, or the Guardian fight, you drink this thing on turn 1 and you dual cast all 3 Dark Orbs, you'll win the fight. That's pretty powerful. That's one of the most... I would dare say this is the most powerful damage potion uh, in Slay the Spire, at least when it comes to fights that last more than a couple of turns. There's a lot of other utility you can have with this. You can use it to fill up your orb slots for a fission. You can use it to evoke frost orbs to get immediate block, since it, it'll evoke every orb that you have immediately. Um, you can use it to get orb variety for Compile Driver. It's powerful, and I, I have to rank this as one of the, the highest tier potions. I might be putting this in S tier, just for how powerful it is when it's good. When it's not good, it's pretty sad, but I think it's always um, at least as much damage as a damage potion, and might often be way, way better than that. Notably, it's really hilarious with Sacred Bark. If you have Sacred Bark, then it channels two Dark Orbs per orb slot. Think about that for a second. They don't fit. You just kind of like bloop all the orbs at somebody. Dar Essence of Darkness plus 10 orb slots plus Sacred Bark is a fun time. But yeah, that'll be our first our first S tier potion. I think there'll be a few more joining it shortly. How about the Gambler's Brew? Gambler's Brew lets you discard any number of cards in your hand to draw that many, potentially being as much as a draw 10. Notably, Gambler's Brew does suffer from the fact that it is not boosted by Sacred Bark. It doesn't do anything more. You don't get any more cards drawn. You don't get to discard anything more. That said, being able to draw up to 10 is a mighty powerful thing. Particularly useful on the silent because the discard effect will activate any discard related synergy for that character. So if you discard a reflex or tactician with a gambler's brew, that'll work. You'll get the energy or the card draw. And this will also activate the relics, tough bandages and tingsha. So Silent in particular loves a gambler's brew. I think she also loves gambler's brew in particular because of her greater turn one draw which would probably be enough to put it in A tier overall. But maybe maybe Gambler's is B. Probably, I'm, I'm feeling somewhere solidly on the A-B line, quite frankly. Gambler's Brew is fantastic. Not quite as good as some of the really good potions, but definitely one that starts pretty solid and gets better and better with time. I'll let it, I'll let it rest in B. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of A tier potions to add momentarily. Ghost in a Jaw. Ghost in Jar's one intangible, essentially one turn of invulnerability. Only the Silent gets access to this ridiculously good potion. But the Ghost has saved many, many, many of my runs. What Ghost in Jar amounts to for me is a get out of jail free card. Any one turn becomes no incoming damage. Which means that it's very hard to die as long as you have a Ghost in a Jar, because if anything bad happens, you have an out. As early as Act 1, this can save you 20 plus health um, by blocking a knob attack or a, a Legavulin hit. You can use it to block the Slime Boss's big crush. You can use it to block Inferno from Hexaghost. And the later you get into the run, the better it becomes. There are 50 plus damage hits that'll be headed your way in Act 3 or Act 2 that the Ghost Najar can completely negate. Bronze Automatons, Hyper Beam, Champs, Execute, Hearts, big hit, the list goes on and on and on. Ghost and Jar becomes so fantastic then, not because it has the power to completely shut down the end game like some other potions do, looking at you, Ancient Potion, but also because it does that at any stage of the game with great flexibility. It's just so good. Might even call it the best potion in Slay the Spire, um, but I don't think it is because Ambrosia exists. Spoiler alert. <laughs> All right, the other class-specific rare potion, the Heart of Iron. 
I almost forgot this, what this thing was called. Heart of Iron gives you six metallicize. That's six block per turn and no stinky decay on it when you're hit like the Essence of Steel. I really like the Heart of Iron. I think it's a, a really, really cool potion. Not quite top tier. Um, although it, the longer the fight goes on, the better it becomes. Easily 30 to 40 health saved against uh, a boss or against the heart. And it can be really neat if you stack it with other copies of the Metallicized Power or something like Oracalcum. There's a whole bunch of situations that the Heart of Iron shuts down. But ultimately, it's not uh, quite as defining as some of the other S-tier potions, I think. This says, it's really hard to know when to use Heart of Iron. That can be definitely a tricky portion. Heart of Iron is uh, certainly tricky to... Tricky to time, because you have to know that you're going to be short on a block, and you have to know that the fight is going to last long enough to get real use out of it. My recommended uses for Heart of Iron are usually boss fights of some kind, or a dangerous but lengthy elite fight. Those are both uh, those are both good times to use it. All right, how about the Entropic Brew? Entropic Brew fills all your empty potion slots with random potions, and I think that is really handy. When, by default, I'm playing on Ascension 20. I only have two potion slots normally. So the Entropic Brew is two random potions, which is pretty good, but not amazing. However, if you get more potion slots, then this can become really, really strong with up to five random potions being in one Entropic Brew. Notably, Entropic Brew can spawn more Entropic Brews. So if you're really lucky, you can chain react and get even more potions. Entropic Brew gets really crazy if you have the Toy Ornithopter Relic because you'll heal from using the Entropic Brew and from all the, the, the children potions. Um, definitely a very, very good, very, very good overall potion. I'm going to put it up in A tier because I, I want to make something clear, which is that a, a, a very good potion that you know what it is is better than an, an Entropic Brew. So I would almost always prefer to discard Entropic Brew or um, better yet, drink it and then discard whatever comes out of it in order to pick up a ghost in a jar, then have two potions. And the same goes for Ambrosia. If I were to nominate any one potion as best in the game, it would be this thing, the purple doom juice. Instant, am uh, instant triple damage, instant three energy. Uh, Ambrosia pretty much allows the watcher to destroy any one threat, any one combat. Just like a fairy in a jar, I tend to think of an Ambrosia as something that lets you take a, an aggressive path and risky choices without necessarily even needing to use it. The fact that you have it as an emergency button is often enough. Ranking this up here with... I think the S tier potions uh, would be po potions that I define as able, of, able to single-handedly win an encounter or able to completely change the outcome of a battle simply on their own, almost no matter what else is going on. All right, we're down to, we're down to some of the more unusual potions. I'm looking forward to ranking these. Colorless Potion. I think Colorless Potion is a little underrated collectively. The Colorless card pool isn't that big, although it is bigger than the card pool for uh, attack skill or power potions for any given character. I think there's 45 different cards a Colorless Potion can generate. Some of them are pretty good. This can generate free copies of Apotheosis to upgrade everything in your deck. Free copies of Hand of Greed to do damage and make you money. Free copy of Secret Technique or Secret Weapon or Master Strategy. I tend to think of Colorless Potions as usually either damage or card draw. As they're usually one of the two when drank. And so as long as you expect them to be one of those things, they can perform pretty well. Timing them can be difficult, and you can definitely whiff with a colorless potion, but a well-timed and well-used well colorless potion can have a really good impact on a fight. I'm going to put it up in B tier here. I think colorless potions are... they're solid. They're, they're fairly average. I tend to rate them higher than skill potions and block potions on average. Maybe not block potion. Hmm. If I put block potion in C, maybe colorless belongs in C. Maybe explosive belongs in C. Now I'm doubting everything. I do think the lower tiers need some more population. So you know what? I will move you down to C tier, colorless potion. 
That said, I do think these are a little underrated still. How about the Cultist Potion? Cultist Potion is one strength per turn. A very interesting potion. Cultist Potion, only in very long fights, is a very good potion. You, uh, most fights in Slay the Spire are short enough that you'll get more strength out of a Strength Potion than you will out of a Cultist Potion. However, the Cultist Potion can be a really nice answer to long, drawn-out fights where you need a lot of damage. I'm thinking the Giant Head, I'm thinking the Champ, I'm thinking Hexaghost or Guardian or Slime Boss, I'm thinking the Heart. And in those fights, if you need additional strength, they, this potion can absolutely be a huge game changer and can be a run winner. I've, I've certainly had runs that won off the back of Cultist Potion. And uh, if you have Sacred Bark, two strength per turn is very, very much very quickly. That said, I often tend to find that the Cultist Potion ends up being dead weight because it is such a slow potion in what it does. For that reason, I'm going to rank it kind of middle of the road in B tier here. The Cultist Potion is very, very powerful under the correct circumstances, just like a real demon form, right? Uh, very, very powerful, but very, very slow. And so you need to have a situation where slow but powerful is the correct answer. How about Shiv Potion? Shiv Potion is, it's a damage potion. Gives you three Shiv Pluses on the silent. So 18 damage total. And it can be more if you are able to make your opponent vulnerable. It can be more if you've got relics or strength that boost it. It's a, I'd like to think of this as a damage potion that can scale, but it's ultimately about as good as a fire potion. So I think I'll put it in the same tier as the fire potion in B tier here. Dexterity potion, an oldie and a goodie. If you play slow and defensive, a dex potion can be exactly what you need. A very nice potion for helping out in an elite fight where you're short a bit of block or in a boss fight where you need a little bit of an edge. I'm specifically thinking against champ, um, but against any Act 3 boss as well, the Awaken one, the Time Eater, or Donu and Dekka, a Dexterity Potion can make a really big difference. That said, I'm not usually that happy with Dex Potions, and I don't think I end up using them all that much. So I think I'm going to be putting it down here in C tier. Pretty good with Sacred Bark. Four Dexterity is more than a, a Footwork Plus, and it can really make the difference for Silent especially. Is Speed Potion better than Dex Potion? I tend to think so. If you're able to, if you're able to negate the debuff of the Speed Potion, the Speed Potion can be two and a half Dexterity Potions. Um, and that said, just having one impactful turn sometimes can be better than having a lot of slightly improved turns. So for that reason, I tend to think that the Speed Potion is a bit better than the Dex Potion. Not to say the Dex Potion doesn't have use. It's definitely a a nice potion, but I, I don't think it really excels at any at any particular thing. Okay, this file is, I think this is the Distilled Chaos. Uh, normally this is a, a rainbow shifting shimmering color potion, but we don't have an animated version here for you. Distilled Chaos plays the top three cards of the draw pile, and that's kind of a weird thing. Three cards drawn and played can be very powerful at the right time. This can essentially be six energy or more if you top deck some important cards. Uh, very good if you have the Frozen Eye Relic, which lets you see where your cards are in the draw pile. But I do tend to find that Distilled Chaos can really backfire a lot of the time, uh, particularly on the Watcher, but also any character who really cares about their card order. On Defect, you can end up with the wrong orbs. If you use a Distilled Chaos at the wrong time, Watcher can outright kill herself by ending up in Wrath Stance or by playing a Blasphemy or by playing a card that ends her turn with Distilled Chaos. These are all potential problems. Silent and Ironclad don't have as big of a problem, but Ironclad can really end up with the problem of um, you top deck a, a Fiend Fire or something that exhausts all the cards in your hand and then you can't play any more cards. So there are a lot of potential, I like to think of them as landmines that you can run into by playing Distilled Chaos at the wrong time. But playing it at the right time can be pretty dang good. I'm not sure, I think I'll put it in B tier because of these downsides. If I, if you could choose the three cards it played, it would be A or S tier easily, but three off the top of the draw pile with random targets um, doesn't always work out in your favor. That said, if you know all of the things all of the bad things that can happen, then you can know when it's not safe to use a Distilled Chaos. How about Duplication Potion? 
Duplication Potion lets you play one card two times. Or uh, if you've got Sacred Bark, two cards get played two times. The later on in your run you are, the better Duplication Potion gets. You can think of it as this potion is as strong as your strongest card is. The later in the run you are, the better your strongest card will be, on average. And there's all sorts of very busted things you can do by duping. Uh, dupe a card with some kind of quadratic scaling to get really strong effects. For example, duplicate a catalyst to get times nine poison or duplicate a limit break to get times four strength. Uh, but you can also just dupe a strong power like double, double demon form or double deva form or double noxious fumes, double bouncing flask to get your poison started, double leg sweep for a really good block turn. It's flexible, it's powerful. It's not the end all be all. I don't think it quite deserves to be up in S tier, but I might put I might put dupe pot as A plus on average. I think I think the duplication potion is very, very good. Very, very good indeed. Here's an unusual one, the ironclad elixir. Elixir lets you exhaust any number of cards in your hand. By default, that's usually not hugely helpful. Only matters when you would draw those cards again and be impacted by it. In Act 1, I can think of this being pretty useful against certain elites. You destroy defends in your hand against a Grumlin Ob, or just starter cards against a Leg of Ulin. Destroy burns against Hexaghost. On its own, though, it, like I said, if, if you're not getting some kind of beneficial effect from the Elixir, it really doesn't do that much. However, if you have powers or relics that activate when cards are exhausted, that's when the elixir gets really spicy. With Dark Embrace or Feel No Pain, again, this is an ironclad only potion, so we can talk about ironclad specific cards. With Dark Embrace or Feel No Pain, you can gain card draw or block for those cards being exhausted. With Dead Branch, you can get extra cards added to your hand. And with Charon's Ashes, you can deal AoE damage with each card that's being exhausted. And those things can make the Elixir very powerful. That said, most of the time when I see Elixir, I don't feel like it's doing a whole lot, and I'd rather have a potion with an immediate impact. So I don't tend to think that the Elixir rates that highly, but I can't in good conscience put it in the lowest tier. So that's my ranking, C right, C tier for the Elixir. I've got these lower tiers populated. Hey, hey everyone. Did you know that you can now support me directly on YouTube by getting a channel membership? For as low as five bucks a month, you'll get access to perks like custom badges and emojis to use in comments and discounts on the merch store, all while helping support me and this channel to do what I love every day. Just click the join button below to get started. Now back to the video. How about the Swift Potion? Just a draw three cards. It's draw is good. I tend to think that being able to draw draw cards is very, very nice. And a little bit of card draw goes a long way. I do think that Gambler's Brew is better than the Swift Potion, since the Gambler's Brew is usually at least able to draw five, um, but can be a lot more. Whereas Swift Potion is just always three. So I think I'll put Swift Potion one tier below the Gambler's Brew. Notably, though, the Swift Potion does benefit from Sacred Bark, whereas the Gambler's Brew doesn't. But I would also rank this as a, a fairly average potion, the Swift Potion. Later in the game... So it's, it's, a lot of these are going to depend on what act you're in. For example, in the late game, I'd always prefer a Swift Potion over a Fire Potion. But in Act 1, I'd always prefer a Fire Potion over a Swift Potion. Energy Potion. Two unconditional energy. Energy is good. I think most of the time, energy can be used to get some kind of additional numerical value, especially if you have a more expensive deck. Um, probably just put this one tier below the Bottled Miracle. Solidly in B tier there. Two additional energy. Can help you get a, a power in play. Can help you finish off a wounded enemy. Doesn't have any hugely special or interesting interactions. One of the OG potions from launch version of Slay the Spire. Beards and Bacon says, Love me a swift potion against Spear and Shield on turn two. Big agree, but would also prefer a Gambler's Brew even more on that, that exact turn. In either case, yes, I strongly agree that extra draw against Spear and Shield is very helpful. 
How about the bot? Uh, what is this? Liquid Memories, excuse me. Liquid Memories lets us get a card back from the discard pile. I tend to think Liquid Memories is very nearly functionally identical to the duplication potion because you can play a card, get it back from the discard pile, play it again. That's essentially duplicating it. There are a few cards where that's not the case. The duplication potion can double a card that exhausts or removes itself from play, such as a power or an exhausting card. But the Liquid Memories can let you get a card back from a previous turn. Liquid Memories also makes the card at zero cost, which can be very helpful for doing things like playing a very expensive card for free, like discarding on purpose a three cost card, an, a, a demon form, a meteor strike, something like that, and then Liquid Memories to get it into play. Very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. Poison Potion. Poison Potion. Poison Potion is six poison. If you wait all six turns, the Poison Potion will deal 21 damage, making it theoretically slightly better than a Fire Potion. In practice, I usually only tend to see this potion do the first three ticks of damage. Six plus five plus four, which is 15. And I think that's the consistent damage you can get from the Poison Potion. Now, if you're a silent who has poison damage, and remember this poison potion is a silent only potion, po silent only potion, then the poison potion can be a nice way to kind of stack your poison higher against a troublesome elite or a boss. Uh, particularly if you've got catalyst, a poison potion can be really nasty. You can also use the poison potion to remove a layer of artifact from foes, as it does count as a debuff. That said, the Poison Potion overall doesn't really cut it most of the time. Tend to find that either there are potions that are able to get more numerical damage for me, like a Fear Potion or something, and I'm not going to rank Fear Potion that highly either. Or I just don't need the damage. I think I'll end up putting the Poison Potion down in C tier. It's a decent damage potion, not that consistent but does have a few ways to boost it, at least. That's right, before before patch... Uh, not 2.0, I think 1. Point something. Or was it 2.0? Anyway, it used to be an all-characters potion. That's correct. And it was much worse uh, back then. Now that it's silent only, it at least has a reasonable chance of being relevant. That said, I think C tier is about to get more populated here, because we're raiding the... Potion of Capacity. Potion of Capacity gives you two more orb slots, which can be exactly what you need. However, the chance that two orb slots are exactly what you need versus the chance that a Potion of Capacity shows up are unfortunately not usually in alignment with one another. There are a few potions I'm more disappointed to see in Act 1, especially also Act 2 than a Potion of Capacity. Two additional orb slots doesn't actually provide you any numerical impact unless you can fill those orb slots, and I'm rarely in a position to do so when this thing shows up. That said, orb slots are invaluable on the defect, and if you've got focus and good orb generation, or you've got to consume, this thing can be a game changer, especially if you have Sacred Bark or have multiple copies of them. I think overall, not quite a D tier. I, don't, I can't in good conscience put the Potion of Capacity in D tier, because I guarantee I've won heart fights off the back of this thing. But it is all too often the case that additional orb slots are actually a, pun a penalty to the defect, preventing you from evoking orbs and outright hurting you. You can see this in inserter starts on defect, where the additional orb slots are actually a severe hindrance. Uh, for that reason, this potion might just be useless to you when you show it up, when it shows up, and I cannot in good conscience rank it highly. How about the power potion? Power potion's interesting, because I feel like I have to rate this one on a per-class basis. The powers are so different for each of the characters. For example, I think a power potion on defect is very good, because there are a lot of high-cost powers you can get for free, and I think a power potion on watcher is not very good, because the watcher powers usually aren't that helpful. That said, a free, quote-unquote, free power is always a nice thing to potentially have. 
Um, and there's a lot of theoretical use you can get from this. Every character has at least one really nice hit from the power potion. At the very minimum, the, the four different form cards, demon form, deva form, wraith form, and echo form are all very, very powerful finds. But the power potion suffers from the problem of inconsistency. You're not guaranteed to get any particular outcome. And that does make it a little unreliable. I don't think it's a C tier potion, the power potion. I think the power potion does have a pretty good performance overall. I don't think it fits in A tier either because it's inconsistent. So I, I must conclude that it's in B tier. Kind of interesting with Sacred Bark, if you if you have Sacred Bark, you'll get two copies of the same power when you play this. Special note for the Ironclads specifically, the, the card Dual Wield can create multiple copies of a card created from the Power Potion, and they'll all be zero cost if you do that. I've got a lot of specific thoughts on, on particular use cases for the Power Potion. I do tend to think of it as a boss answer. Specifically, I love Power Potions going into the heart because there are so many different powers that help against heart. I think that's part of the design of the heart fight, is that uh, almost all of the different ways the characters can scale themselves all contribute in some way to that fight. Can definitely be awkward with silent, I, I agree to Reiko. That's why my favorite answer is have retain. And if you find a wraith form from the power potion, you just get to hold onto it and play it for three costs later. If you don't find wraith form, you just get a power. All right, regen potion. I think regen potion's nice. Very easy to get value out of, um, but at the same time, it can be difficult to get all 15 health from this thing. Regen Potion heals you for 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 over 5 turns of a fight. You have to know that you're in a combat that's going to last enough time, otherwise you can waste some of the value of it. That said, it's almost always easy to get at least most of the health from a Regen Potion. I think a, a pretty, pretty solid... Actually, no, I'm going to put it in, in C tier with uh, with the block potion, because I think it's about as good as a block potion on average. If you min-max it, it's three more health than a block potion. Otherwise, it could be less. The big noteworthy thing with the regen potion is that it's more powerful in duplicate or triplicate. If you find two of them, then you can get a lot more health out of it. It's also better than... Yes, yeah, it's better than block because it's, it's actual health restoration. Uh, which is relatively hard to come by in Slay the Spire. Maybe that does justify B tier. I want it to be like C+. I would definitely take a regen potion over a fire potion most days. I'll let it be in B tier. With with Sacred Mark, I would say it's A tier. Just a tremendous amount of health. Where's the borderline? We need infinite numbers of tiers. Every potion has its own tier, and then we just rank them from top to bottom. That'd be kind of interesting. Block Pot Plus. Skill Potion. I don't like skill potions very much. I might have Essence of Steel as the only D tier, D -tier potion. I can't quite be true. I can't in good conscience put a skill potion higher than C tier. No matter what character you're talking about, skill potions are very unreliable. Every character has a lot of different skills. And you never know what you're going to get. It might be card draw, it might be damage, it might be three useless cards. Which is often how I tend to feel about the skill potion. Without being able to know what you're going to get, Timing the skill potion is really hard, but sometimes it does bail you out. This can generate the zero cost nightmare, zero cost vault, zero cost impervious on various characters, but ugh, it just, it's unreliable. It's unreliable. Wind conditions sometimes, nothing most times. Good description. Good description. My recommended uses for the skill potion are... It can be a nice I need block situation because there are a lot of blocks that are skills. More accurately, all of the all of the blocks are skills, so you can only get block cards out of a skill potion. But it's not guaranteed to give you block. So a skill potion is best used in a situation where you can make use of either offense or defense. You just need something additional, in which case any potion would probably help you, right? Smoke bomb. Smoke bomb lets you flee one combat. You don't get any rewards, which is the part I take issue with. Rewards are good. You need them in Slay the Spire to get stronger, to scale your deck up, to be powerful. There are some interesting glitches you can do with the Smoke Bomb, some of which we discovered on uh, here on this channel. Let's see, do I have the command? Yeah. For example, you can use the Smoke Bomb 
and then win a combat to glitch out the next combat and skip through it. You can also smoke bomb away from the spear and shield if you throw the smoke bomb at the start of the fight before the surrounded effect loads in. You're quick enough. You can actually just leave instantly from, sm from spear and shield. I should show that off someday. However, if you play Smoke Bomb by the rules, it's a terrible potion. It saves you, maybe, from a combat that you're having trouble in, but the fact that you get no rewards means you're just going to be in trouble in the next combat. Or later down the road. And I cannot, in good conscience, recommend the Smoke Bomb for most situations. The other, other use case for it is the first combat of the Colosseum event in Act 2, when you're accosted by two slavers. That fight gives no rewards normally, so you may use the Smoke Bomb to flee from it for free. Smoke Bomb is a lose more potion instead of a win more. Yes, that's a great description of it. Lose more potion. How about the Sneko Oil? Sneko Oil is very interesting. Quite unique amongst potions. Draw five cards, then randomize the cost of every card in your hand. Two things that are individually kind of powerful, but when combined can be awkward. Awkward, indeed. At its worst, Sneko Oil turns your most important cards into three cost cards, and they stay that way for the rest of the fight. At best, Sneko Oil draws you five cards and then gives you a discount on key ones. Sneko Oil can result in zero cost bludgeons or echo forms or whatnot. My advised use case for the Sneko Oil is a situation where you either need to draw lots more cards immediately, so you're really benefiting from the draw five, or a situation where you already have a two or three cost card in your hand and you would like to, to try to get that for cheap. I also recommend Sneko Oil in situations where the fight is not expected to go on much longer one way or the other, because a low roll from the Sneko Oil can really hurt you. Hilariously, this potion does draw 10 if you have uh, Sacred Bark. So you just fill your hand and then randomize costs. Because of Sneko Oil's unreliability, I can't put in good conscience put it into the high tiers, but it does have uses, more uses than I think people would expect. And I'm going to put it into the, the B tier. Also incredible with any card that costs more than three normally, like Omniscience or Meteor Strike. Elder Sievert says, I think that Sneko Oil would be significantly better if the costs reverted at the end of the turn. I think so too but the fact that it can permanently make cards more or less expensive is uh, at least unique. All right, Stance Potion. I think Stance Potion is one of the better potions. It's not quite as good as a Divinity Potion on Watcher, but simply being able to either get two energy by entering Calm at a time of your choice, or better yet, Wrath whenever you need it, is heckin' useful, and definitely one of the best potions the Watcher has access to. Not quite up there with Ambrosia, but dang good. Also a pretty good potion, the Strength Potion. Two points of strength, makes all your attacks do two more damage. Almost every character really likes the, str the Strength Potion for its consistent damage output. Whether it's early game or late game, Strength Potion is always contributing. Big exception is, attack, uh, is decks that do damage almost entirely with skills or powers. That can be Defect and Silent in the late game particularly. Most other characters will still benefit from Strength. So I think it's pretty good. Not quite up there with Flex, which has the, the higher top end and a bit more flexibility. But Strength is good. Strength is good. Thorns. Thorns Potion is one of, one of the worst damage potions, I tend to think. In many combats, a Thorns Potion will only be three or maybe even not even three damage per turn to one enemy. But in certain fights, the Liquid Bronze can do a heck of a lot of damage, and most notably the Book of Stabbing, and Hexaghost, and the Heart, of course, the Heart with a times 15 attack. In those specific fights, the Liquid Bronze can be very, very useful, but overall I think the Thorns Potion is pretty sad. Oh, and Birds, of course. The Birds. So there's maybe five or six specific combats where it's really, really good. That said, don't underestimate the power of a little bit of extra damage. Even if it's not a lot, you know, even if you're only able to get 9 damage out of a Thorns Potion during a fight, if that 9 damage can save you a lot of health, then it's still a good potion that you should use in that situation. Very notably, I have a distinct memory of a defect run that 
lived or died on the decision to use a Thorns Potion turn one against Reptomancer because I needed three additional damage to kill one of her daggers before it hit me for 25. So that was an example of a, of a fight where a, a very important late game combat hinged entirely on the three damage the Thorns Potion could provide to me. Zutha says, a Thorns Potion could have kept my 11 win streak going by killing Gremlin Knob for me too. Wow. Thorns Potion OP, apparently. Very cool. Very cool. So, a underperforming potion with some very good specific use cases. How I feel about the Thorns Pot. All right, two final potions, the, the status potions, the weak potion and the fear potion. I don't tend to value these too highly, although weak potion can be very good mitigation. Um, the problem with weak is that your opponent either has weak or doesn't has weak. And a lot of the times, a well-constructed deck will have access to the weakened stat al status already, meaning the potion is unnecessary. That said, weak potion can be a very, very useful assistant in blocking the late game, particularly against heart. A well-timed weak potion can save, I want to say, 28 health? 15 damage less on a multi-attack, plus 13 damage less on a big hit? Something like that? Or is it 17? 67 goes to 50. So 32 health. Baylor math. Anyway, double digits amount of health saved with one of these weak potions in the late game, which can make it very, very good but a lot of the time struggles to be as useful as a block potion. Uh, and again, doesn't stack with enemy being already weak. Is usable to consume an artifact charge like the other status potions. But overall, doesn't quite get there. I think the fear potion has a little bit more utility because you are more likely to be able to benefit from vulnerable but not have it. Uh, particularly on the Watcher and on the Silence. This can be a really big multiplier to your damage in the late game, but often faces the same trouble as the Weak Potion, which is that you uh, your opponent can either be vulnerable or not. They can't be double vulnerable, so you can't benefit from, um, from two of these. You can't really benefit from Sacred Bark Empowered version of these. Is six vulnerable instead of three is not that good. And if you really need the vulnerable, you've probably already secured it with a card. This one feels like a C plus. I'm going to put it down in C tier, just with the weak potion. Uh, but I do think that the vulnerable potion has more overall utility than the weak potion. Neither are spectacular. Now, in specific contexts, any of these potions can perform any of the any other of these potions. That's one of the beauties of Slay the Spire. But here is now our completed potion tier list for Slay the Spire. I think a pretty good distribution, just like previous tier lists. We got most of B tier, perfectly even C and A tiers, very small S and D tiers. That's a bell curve if ever I've seen one. Hey there, if you enjoyed that video, watch this one next. And before you go, join us on Twitch and watch live. I'm there five days a week playing Slay the Spire, answering questions and chilling with the community. Click the link in the description to follow right now. Ta-ta for now.